Jennifer Rajkumar, thank you so much for being with us on ITV Gold. How are you doing today? Always good when I'm with you. Of course, you know, we are on the election eve today, so I have so many questions for you. So let's get right into it. My first question has to be about your campaign run. You've had a very successful campaign run and you've won your primaries. You could be the first South Asian American woman sitting on the New York State Assembly. So my question to you is, how has this journey been for you so far, especially in the last few months when, you know, things have gotten very intense with elections? You're correct. We made history. I will be the first South Asian woman elected to any government office in New York State. Wow. And this really is the people's victory. When I started, people said, she's a nice girl, but she has no chance. But not only did we win, but we won by the largest margin of any challenger in the entire state, by 27 percentage points. Wow. And this really was the people's victory. The entire South Asian community came out. Bengali families, Punjabi families, Indo-Caribbean families. Right. And after I won, my phone rang for two weeks straight. Oh, wow. It was families in the district saying, I'm so happy you won. Not only did I vote, but my aunts voted for you. My uncles voted for you. My yeah. niece, my grandparents, we all came out. So this was truly the people's victory. And your district actually had, I guess, one of the lowest turnouts in voting, if I'm right. And you kind of totally turned it over. And a lot of them were South Asians supporting you. Why did you have you know, that kind of strategy to like reach out to our diaspora in that district the most? Correct. We actually tripled turnout in this district. Wow. So this was the lowest voting turnout district in all of Queens and one of the top five lowest in the entire state. Oh, wow. We tripled the turnout because we had such an energetic operation. And you're correct, we cross cut. So not only did we bring out the South Asian community mm. and united the South Asian community, mm. but we were also the candidate of the Latino community and of uh, all the communities right. across every demographic and also across political ideology. We won both progressives and conservative Democrats. Oh, wow. That is pretty fantastic. You know, when you're looking at your district right now, District 39, we were talking about it, um, What are the issues that matter the most there, according to you? You are talking about making Queens a better place, you know, a better Queens is what you are, you know, endorsing as well. Um, what are the issues that really matter to the communities? And what were, what were some of the issues that matter to you when you started this run? Well, this district is 72% immigrant. Wow. Immigrant families like mine came to South Queens with hopes and dreams, and they need a place to go. to make those hopes and dreams a reality. And that is what my office will strive to do, to make the immigrant families' hopes and dreams a reality in this country. So my office will be a place where immigrants can go to right. learn how to navigate our courtrooms, navigate the justice system, navigate education, and navigate government. So that is one thing that I'm looking forward to doing. Mm. Um, also, there's a lot of extremism in our politics right now. And most people are not either extreme. Right. So my office will also be a place where everybody can go. Okay, let's talk a little bit about COVID-19 because we can never shy away from that. We are in a healthcare crisis as we speak. What has been the impact of COVID-19 on the district that you will be representing? And, you know, when we're looking at New York, we were the epicenter and Queens was one of the places that really had a surge of cases. So what, how has that impacted uh, your district economically and in healthcare? Back in March and April, my district was one of the hardest hit by the coronavirus pandemic. Wow. A top priority of mine is going to be economic rebuilding. Hmm. Almost 1 million Americans are now unemployed. New York State has a budget deficit exceeding 14 billion. So now more than ever is the time for real leadership in government. Mm. We can no longer afford to have mediocre representatives. So I'm going to prioritize excellence right. and also rebuilding our district, making sure that small businesses can rebuild and thrive. Right. What about the most vulnerable communities that really need an upliftment right now? What do you think is needed to help those communities? You know, we've seen food insecurity as an issue. We've seen people not being able to pay their rent. Unemployment is high. So how do you uplift that? After winning my primary election, mm. we attacked food insecurity head on mm. by 
creating food distributions outside of underserved areas. Because my district in South Queen has, has been overlooked and underfunded for a very long time. Hmm. And so we organized food distributions outside of mosques and areas that have been underserved. On the level of policy, hmm. we need to make reforms that will make life a little easier for workers. For example, uh, we need to do things like close, closing the tipped wage loophole. Hmm. Um, oftentimes tipped wage workers are held to a different minimum wage standard than other workers. Hmm. That's an inequality that makes life harder for workers. Also helping our small businesses. There is uh, an innovative bill in Albany called the Small Business Insurance Interruption Act. Okay. And what it does is it compels insurance companies to pay out if a small business has gone under due to coronavirus or, who, who, or if they've been interrupted due to mm -hmm. coronavirus. And so it, Century 21 would not be bankrupt today. It would still be in existence if insurance companies had paid out. Right. So making reforms that will allow businesses to thrive will be a top priority. You know, um, if and when you win, you will be joining in the state assembly during perhaps the second surge of COVID-19 that we will see across the nation. We're seeing it in parts of the country already. Um, you know, what is your focus going to be in the beginning? And, you know, how worried are you about the second surge as somebody who's about to be a state assembly person? Very worried, yeah. very worried and very vigilant. So I'm going to be working 25 hours a day just like the people in my district. The people in my district also work 25 hours a day. Wow. So I'm gonna make it a priority to make sure that their work uh, bears fruit. Right. And one of those things, again, on the economic rebuilding, hmm. is to make sure that people have jobs. And we have a big opportunity in my district. Nearby, we have the JFK airport, wow. and that's undergoing a big redevelopment. And this is a big opportunity for jobs for people in my district in that development. So I will be an advocate uh, for jobs for my constituents. Of course, you know, just talking more about issues that truly impact, uh, you know, the South Asian community here, I'd like to discuss women's rights with you. Um, first, I would like to know your opinion on Justice Barrett's, um, you know, confirmation, which happened before the House has even passed the stimulus package, and, you know, how we are seeing uh, Roe v. Wade under threat. Um, how would you, as a state assembly woman, handle this? And you know, what is your comment on the fact that women's rights are being threatened in this election? Ruth Bader Ginsburg was my favorite Supreme Court justice. Yeah. Uh, and I pledge to honor her in all of my work. Uh, whatever I can do to honor her, I will do that. Uh, she's an example of what one woman can do um, to make history for all women in their lifetime. Hmm. Her dissenting opinions are, are works of art. Um, and she has been a, a guiding light uh, for people. And uh, when I was in law school, I remember clerking at the ACLU Women's Rights Project, which was founded by Ruth Bader Ginsburg herself. So when I reflect back on her life, I'm truly in awe. And, um, and that's uh, where I am right now. So my goal is to do the best I can to live up to heroes like her. Yeah. Now we have Kamala Harris, Yes. who is hopefully on the verge of being our next vice president. So I look at all of these women making history, mm -hmm. and that's what inspires me. And my goal is also to uplift other women and help them also come up, because that's truly going to change society. Just, you know, as a woman to a woman, do you think in 2020 or say in 2021, should we still be talking about protecting our reproductive rights or just our rights getting full pay, you know, getting equality in gender. Um, how do you feel about that? No, we should not still be talking about it. Right. Uh, in fact, we should already have an equal rights amendment that should be part of our constitution. It's common sense. An equal rights amendment which enshrines equality between men and women mm. in the constitution. Uh, that is long overdue. So after the suffragists won the right for American women to vote so heroically in 1920, the next frontier for the women's movement was the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. Right. But it's been now 100 years and it still has not happened.
So that has to change. But when I look at the remarkable women that are leading the way right now in our politics, including possibly the first woman vice president, um, I'm filled with hope. And I think that we can get there. And I think we can get there within the next 20 years. Definitely. You know, what have you felt about this South Asian American representation that we have seen in this election? What kind of message do you think people like yourself or Senator Kamala Harris send across the nation when there is a South Asian woman on a ticket, you know, hoping to win? So how how does that work? I think our community is truly on fire right now. Hmm. The South Asian community has been successful in so many fields, medicine, engineering, business. And now we are finally taking our seat at the table of power in government. Hmm. I've seen that firsthand in New York State, but it's happening all over the country. Uh, And you're seeing new South Asian groups emerging, which are supporting South Asian candidates all across the country. It's truly inspiring and I can't wait to see where our community will go from here. I personally feel like the sky is the limit for the South Asian community. Definitely. Here's to hoping the best for the community. Let's just discuss more on the issues that are impacting the community even during this election. Education is another aspect of, you know, a very important aspect of the South Asian culture. Um, We really, really, really press on academics and the importance of that. Um, Right now, when you're in an education crisis, um, what is needed, at least in your district, to make sure that every kid has access and resources to education? Because we have heard that There's a huge portion of students that don't even have access to proper Wi-Fi, proper internet, and education is truly a crisis. How will you handle that? There were schools in my district where more people would drop out every year than would graduate. I believe that a active, engaged assembly woman can change the situation. I truly believe that one caring leader can can, can make the difference in many ways, by providing mentorship to children in the district, okay, by providing support that our educators and our parents need, and by making sure that South Queens receives its fair share of education funding. Yeah. So that will all be a top priority of mine in office because mm-hmm. education is what opened doors for me. I am sitting across from you right now because of the opportunities that education provided. Right. When my parents immigrated to this country, they made education the center of my household. Right. And I know that that opens doors and I'm gonna make sure that those doors are opened for everybody else. Yeah, I really hope you do. You know, when we're looking at just the, uh, the immigrant community, um, you know, immigration is again, a huge uh, aspect of this uh, election. My question to you is, according to you, what does the future of immigration look like? Say in a Biden-Harris ticket and If so, what will happen to the undocumented and the DACA recipients? I think that we need comprehensive immigration reform Hmm. in the United States. It's been a long time in the coming. But before we get there, we need to start with the basics, which is respect, respect for all. And the Biden-Harris administration will be respectful of immigrants from every country. Because it is my firm belief that Everyone should be treated with certain dignity and respect Mm -hmm. simply because they are on American soil, because that's who we are. So that's why when I worked for the governor of New York Mm -hmm. and I was directing immigration, I built a $31 million program to make sure all immigrants have access to legal counsel in immigration proceedings, because I believe that everyone deserves the right to be heard. Everyone deserves at least a fair shot. Mm -hmm. That's what we're about. So after we return to our ideals Hmm. of treating all immigrants with respect and decency, we can then also work on comprehensive immigration reform, Hmm. okay, which is making sure that we take care of children that were bought here at a young age, because they are truly American. Even if their parents came across the border illegally, the children are American. Okay, and they deserve uh, all of the rights and privileges of citizenship. Mm. Many of them are straight A students and they succeed and they're really contributing to our economy. Um, I do believe in border security, yeah. but I also believe that we should treat everyone with decency and respect. Yeah, that's so true. What have you felt about immigration policies for the last four years under Trump administration? 
I think uh, they have not been smart, to say the least. It's been um, not who we are. The Muslim ban executive order yeah. that he issued was uh, a travesty because religion should never be a criteria for entering the United States. The First Amendment to the United States Constitution is freedom of religion. Yeah. So we need to return to our American ideals. Um, also, he's instilled fear in immigrant communities. Uh, one week, he announced that at the end of the week, one million immigrants would be deported. This caused a chilling effect in communities. There was no reason to do this. It was not smart. We need to return to decency and smart policies. What do you think about the xenophobic rhetoric that we have seen in the last four years? Um, how important is that to you to sort of uh, combat? I uh, have no words for the xenophobic rhetoric. Hmm. I'm looking forward. Uh, we are on the verge of a big election. Tomorrow is a big election. Yeah. We have the chance to elect someone that our children can be proud of. Um, and I'm, I'm forward looking right now. Hmm. Uh, I think it has been a very negative political space, hmm. full of extremism, uh, full of undignified language, hmm. lacking in decency. And I know we can do better than this. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to putting this behind me. And I know many Americans are. And you so know, that's why I urge all, all Americans to get out and vote tomorrow. Yes. It's very important. Get out and vote and tell the story. Have a story that you can tell to your children and to future generations of what you did on November 3rd, 2020. Yes, everyone, make sure you are voting. We have just one day left for this election. Go on IWillVote.com for more information. Just discussing more on this, Jennifer, um, you know, I would love to discuss what you have felt about these two campaign trails that we have seen. Very, very different from each other. Um, you know, one is hosting rallies with thousands and thousands of Americans. The other one are hosting rallies in a drive-in way, more secure, more safe, socially distanced. What message is being sent across the nation, according to you, with the, the whole run that we have seen? The Biden-Harris administration is showing that public health matters and smart public health policy. That's why you see these car rallies done by Kamala and, and Joe Biden. Yeah. Uh, and they're nothing that we've ever seen before. But that's what public health demands. And a serious leader will rise to the occasion and lead the American public. Tell them that masks are necessary. Yeah. Show them by example that we have to socially distance. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what the Biden-Harris campaign is doing. And just on you know the measures we all have to take to take care of ourselves, do you believe that we should have a mask mandate? I, I do. I think that public health comes first um, and that we need to protect the health and welfare of all American citizens. Yes. Um, and we need to make sure that everybody's dinner table remains full, all family members. Because right now, you know, so many people have lost a loved one and yeah. there's that empty seat at the dinner table. So if a mask mandate will help us get there, then absolutely yes. You know, the, the, safe, uh, the safety and welfare of our citizens comes first. Definitely. You know, I want to continue talking to you more about things that are impacting this election. I have to talk to you about the racial unrest that we have seen in the last so many months, especially since the death of George Floyd in Minnesota. Um, how have you looked at this entire racial unrest movement? And also, how do you look at an organization like Black Lives Matter, who continue to protest, who continue to assemble, who continue to demonstrate? Um, as an assemblywoman, how would you take care of this racial unrest issue? Because we see it in New York, definitely all the time, the protests happening, and there is a backlash too. So how would you take care of that? I think peaceable marches, mm. peaceable protests have been a tradition in America. Yeah. If you think back to our civil rights movement, you can almost see the images in your head of Martin Luther King marching. That's part of our tradition, and I'm proud of anybody who wants to march uh, for equality. I think that that's a wonderful thing. I think that we have a long way to go towards racial equality. Mm. 
At the current rate, within the next few decades, one third of the African American population will be imprisoned. Oh, wow. This is a crisis. Now, I have heard firsthand from many constituents in my district that call me concerned. Um, and they are very con deeply concerned with police brutality issues. Right. And I'm very touched by their passion. Uh, and I, I have invited these constituents to become a part of our campaign and help us formulate policies to build trust between law enforcement and minority communities. That trust has to be built. That is so true. You know, when you're looking at the issue of systemic racism and the fact that it impacts everyone, you know, not just the African-American community, but it also impacts us as South Asians, how do we educate people, according to you? I think we need to look back at history. Hmm. Uh, it's really amazing to look back at racial justice and the South Asian community. In 1923, the United States Supreme Court actually ruled that Indians and Sikhs could not be United States citizens. Um, we've come a long way. Uh, but also in the late 1800s, right. the United States Congress passed a law barring Chinese individuals from immigrating to this country. It was called the Chinese Exclusion Act. So when you look back at this history, it really gives you a sense of where we've been, where we are, and where we need to go. Right. That is so true. I And I really hope that we come across, you know, we actually win over this racial unrest issue that there are leaders such as you who want to have, you know, some kind of uh, solution on this problem of police brutality and minority communities. Just discussing more on the election again, Jennifer, another issue that truly impacts uh, communities are the LGBTQ rights as well. Um, we have seen that under the Trump administration, they have been threatened, their rights have been threatened from the White House. Um, the kind of information that we get is not favoring the community. What do you think about the plight of the LGBTQ community and what would you do for them? I was very proud when marriage equality became the law of the land. Mm. I saw it happen here in New York and then the U.S. Supreme Court a few years later right. made it the law for the entire country. Um, and earlier we saw the repeal of don't ask, don't tell, yeah. um, allowing for equality um, in the military for LGBTQ individuals. Uh, so I believe that uh, LGBTQ individuals should be treated with respect and uh, also the trans community right, right. now has been uh, suffering a lot. There have been reports of people being murdered oh, wow. just because they are trans and that murder rate is up. And that is unacceptable and that has to change. Uh, and I'm going to make sure that I champion the rights of transgender individuals as a New York State lawmaker. Definitely. And I think a lot of education needs to happen on that. And I think people are still so ignorant about so many things. Um, how do you look at climate change, Jennifer? That's a huge issue that I feel like has not been discussed enough in these elections because the, the race has become kind of nasty in certain states. Um, clean energy and climate change is a real thing, as we know. And I know the Biden-Harris administration has a plan too. I would like to know your plan. I believe that we need to get to a green economy. I'm very excited hmm. by the idea of a green economy with green jobs in solar energy and wind and clean energy, a right. whole new clean energy economy. And it's imperative that we start creating one for future generations. Oh, we need to make sure that we divest of fossil fuels. Right. That is very important um, and really take the steps to make a clean energy transition. But before we even do that, we need to first uh, make uh, our plans based on science. We need to, right. we need to admit that climate change is, is actually happening because there are many people that still deny that climate change is actually occurring. Yeah. Okay? So I think that we need our leaders to explain clearly in a way that people can understand based on scientific fact that this is in fact a real phenomenon. And then we need to take the steps to get to a clean energy economy. That is so true. Do you believe, according to you, that the Biden-Harris administration will bring in these progressive changes, especially when you're looking at clean energy? Absolutely. Hmm. It's very exciting to think about the administration that will come with the Biden-Harris election. 
uh, they're going to bring in so many bright lights and so much brain power, so much expertise. They're going to bring in the future of the Democratic Party into their administration. And that is one major reason to make sure that they get elected tomorrow. You know, Jennifer, I know South Asians play a really pivotal role in your district, but you know, we have about, I think, more than 2.5 million South Asians eligible to vote this year. And, you know, they play certain pivotal roles in certain swing states as well. How are you looking at the South Asian vote this year when you're looking at the presidential election? I think the South Asian community uh, is very big, even in some key swing states. Mm -hmm. Michigan, for example, has a robust South Asian population. Right. And if South Asians exercise their right to vote in, in key swing states, that could make a real big difference in this election. That is so true. How are you looking at the election day? What do you think will happen tomorrow? Well, there have been incredible lines at the polls the past week, even here in New York. I have never seen anything like it. I have never seen lines this big. Wow. And we have never had this many early votes before the actual election day. Um, so the big turnout, I believe, is very good for the Democratic Party. Um, I think that that bodes well for the election of Joe Biden. We may not even know tomorrow night who yeah. the winner is. It may take a while for ballots to get counted. Uh, things may be litigated, mm -hmm. but I do hope for a peaceful transition. What do you say then when President Donald Trump doesn't agree for a peaceful transition on any public platform? That's unfortunate because a peaceful transition is a cornerstone of a democratic republic. Yeah. And in the United States of America, we have always had peaceful transitions. That's who we are. Uh, I don't believe we will have a problem. Okay. Um, I think that American citizens are going to stand up and they're gonna coalesce around the winner. You know, I want to discuss, I just have a couple of questions left for you here. You know, we are here in New York City. The news is a lot of places are being boarded up, uh, just like we saw during the unrest after George Floyd's death. Um, there's news coming about backlash to election result. Are you prepared for that as, um, you know, a soon-to-be assemblywoman? And how do you think the state government and the city government would handle any kind of unrest if we see any? I'm prepared for that okay. because I have faith in the American people. I know that people will act de decently and I know that people will coalesce around the winner. I have faith in the American people. You know, uh, when we're talking about this too, another thing that I would like to know if you have faith in uh, would be the entire system of election protection. Um, President Donald Trump has gone and um, accused perhaps mail-in ballots as, as something that's not as viable. Um, he's questioned Dropbox ballots as well. He's questioned early voting as well. Um, can you guarantee that all the votes that get counted in New York City, or at least in your district, will be all fair? And how are you maintaining this election protection process uh, during the cycle? I will fight hard to make sure that every vote is counted. I have already been fighting to do that in the primary election, hmm. where we had an incredible number of absentee ballots that were mailed in. Also, I'm in touch with election lawyers. Hmm. Uh, they are on standby to help everybody and make sure that their votes are counted. Um, I also am a liaison between my constituents and the Board of Elections oh, wow. to make sure that uh, the Board of Elections answers constituent concerns. So I'm doing everything I can to make sure that everyone expresses themselves. But you trust the system for elections this I year. do, and I also trust our judicial system. Hmm. Um, I trust our lawyers, and I trust the people, the people that have been standing in line for hours to make sure right. that they get to cast their ballot. Yeah. Uh, so the people give me faith. You know, people in my district are also tracking their ballots. There's a new ballot tracking right. system in New York. So voters are being very vigilant. Hmm. And it is truly inspiring to see that kind of coming together and that kind of vigor in our democracy. And I also trust our brilliant election lawyers. Hmm. And I trust the law. And I know 
that we're going to have a peaceful transition and that the votes will be counted. You know, finally, Jennifer, I have to ask you, what is going to be your first 100 days plan uh, once you get elected? What are you going to be focused on in where we are still in the pandemic, there's still so, uh, you know, social unrest, there are the same issues that we've been talking about continuously goes on. What's in, on your agenda for the first 100 days? So my district has been underserved and overlooked for a very long time. Mm. I'm going to make sure that we have robust social services available in the first 100 days. My office will be a place where people can come to for help, especially at a time like this, right. a pandemic where unemployment is sky high and people are struggling. Uh, number two, economic development and the economic rebuilding of my district will be a top priority of my first 100 days. And then number three, uplifting our youth. Oh, yes. To make sure the youth all around our district have every opportunity in the world. Yeah, that is so, so important. What's your message to the South Asian community right now? My message to the South Asian community is the sky is the limit for you. Hmm. We showed that in our election, it was the people's victory. South Asians came out and voted for me and gave us the largest win percentage-wise of any challenger in the state. And now we will elect the first South Asian woman to the vice presidency tomorrow. So this is the time for our community to shine. So dream and dream big. And finally, what states are you watching right now, Jennifer? I'm watch watching Michigan, Pennsylvania, hmm. Wisconsin, and Florida. Wow. Yeah, battlegrounds here. I just hope that it's the best result that's best for the nation. Thank you so much for your time on ITV Gold. And I would love for you to tell everyone to go out and vote if they haven't so far. Please, everybody, go out and vote. This is the election of a lifetime. November 3rd, 2020, go to the poll, take a selfie, enjoy it, bring back a story, and make history. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for your time here. Thank you. Thank you.